Good afternoon and welcome to the second workshop in the context of our um, expert committee from the Dutch Royal Society of Arts and Sciences on the impact of COVID on scientists, scientific practices and trust in science. I'm Natalie Halberger, I'm Distinguished University Professor for Law and AI at the University of Amsterdam and Chair of this committee, together with a number of impressive colleagues here from the KNW. Our committee was established to take stock of the positive and negative effects of the COVID pandemic on scientists, scientific practice and trust in science, with special attention to young academic and also the long-term consequences of the pandemic for science. And let me add that we use the notion of science here in a broad and inclusive manner, meaning all areas of academic research, also in the SSR, and not only, of course, science in the strict sense. An important task for this committee is also to look into the future and make recommendations for retaining positive consequences or a momentum for positive change to our practices, as well as ways of mitigating or remedying its negative consequences. Last week, we had an engaged discussion already in our first workshop on trustworthy science in the public domain. Um, and this discussion, you can uh, look back soon uh, on YouTube. And for information, please um, visit the Carnivale website. And today, we will look into the second topic that will feature prominently in our report, the impact of COVID-19 on researchers. For information on the following two workshops in this series, please uh, also consult our website, or maybe Eva, you could put the link in the chat. And once we talk about the chat, one more word about the chat. Um, your opinions, experiences, and suggestions matter greatly for this report. So please use the Q&A function to ask questions or post comments and suggestions. And if you have a question for a specific speaker, please start with the name of the speaker. We will monitor the chat and do our best to address as many questions uh, during today's meeting as possible. And all the input in the chat will be kept and used in the advisory trajectory. And now I have the great pleasure to introduce our two days moderator, Dr. Bettina reitz jose a social professor of Latin language and literature at the University of Groningen and member of the Canaves Young Academy. Bettina, I hand over to you. Thank you so much, Natalie. A very warm welcome to everyone here to our speakers, to everyone who's listening and hopefully discussing. What we want to do today is to understand a little better the effect of the pandemic on researchers themselves, on their productivity, but also their well-being or lack of. We've noticed that there are huge differences between the disciplines of researchers, between their career stages, between their care the, the care obligations they have. And um, we want to explore a little more deeply what the pandemic has meant for different groups in what way. What the way we'll do this is we'll start by Thijs Bol introducing a report that has just been published on what we can tell until now, basically, about the effect of the first lockdown on different types of researchers in the Netherlands. And then in the second half, we'll make it very concrete and very personal um, when different researchers from different groups, different disciplines tell us about their experience. And we turn from analysis to, of the present to, to the future, what we can, can and should do to mitigate the effects of this pandemic and maybe prepare for future ones, even though we're hoping, of course, that there never will be. Um, I'm, I'd like to hand over right away to Thijs Bol, who is Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Amsterdam and a member of the Young Academy um, to introduce uh, this report. Thank you, Thijs. Thanks a lot for, yes, um, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation and the, and the, and the very neat planning uh, so that we're able to present this report that was released uh, two days ago. Um, <clears throat> so today I will, I will uh, explain to you a bit uh, uh, what we found in this report. And this is uh, the report two days ago it was released and it's a, a report that is um, uh, 
uh, a collaboration between uh, the Young Academy, the Young Academy, and the Dutch Network of Women Professors, the LNVH. Uh, and more specifically, I'm presenting this report here, but it was really co-authored uh, uh, with three people, with myself, but also with uh, Belle Derks, who can't be here today, and with Lidwin Porthuis from the uh, LNVH, who is here today and uh, might also be able to answer some questions whenever uh, that's necessary. So today, what I want to do is I want to talk about the report. I uh, want to share the main findings and the recommendations that we have. Uh, but of course, we're also very, very interested in your suggestions, in your questions, in things that we might have missed or things that are not clear. Uh, and we definitely also want to talk about uh, how to proceed further with uh, the effects of the pandemic. Uh, now, let me first uh, uh, give a bit of background on uh, the start of this report, which is actually quite long ago. It was during the first lockdown. And, and just like many of us here, uh, probably uh, before this started, we just had a had a talk amongst the panelists uh, where many kids were at home or had care duties or had to be picked up from school. Uh, and in the first lockdown, of course, uh, many of us had this too. So uh, these are my two kids, uh, Otto on the left and Ezra on the right. And uh, Otto is uh, uh, two years old here, Ezra six, and they were uh, making their uh, schoolwork from home. Uh, and, and sometimes it was like this, so Otto was playing and Ezra was doing his, uh, his schoolwork, uh, but sometimes it also was like this, and uh, this is uh, where they uh, uh, picked uh, the caster sugar, the powdered sugar from the cabinet, and they put it out on the, uh, the, the table that we have outside, and they started to lick it off the table. So that was sort of the situation in which we were expected to work. And I was talking uh, uh, about this to, to Bella, but also to Lidwin, how, how difficult it was to combine all tasks. And at the same time, I was also talking to colleagues who had no children at home, with no care duties, and were feeling lonely and isolated in their work. So it was very clear that the pandemic uh, uh, was affecting uh, academia. And already very early on in, uh, uh, in the pandemic, uh, people uh, were writing opinion articles about. So this is an article in Nature, uh, was published very early at the start of the pandemic. Pandemic burnout is rampant in academia. Right? And, and early studies indeed found that the effects of the pandemic on uh, uh, academics was, might be different. Right? So this is uh, uh, the number of submissions that were being uh, uh, sent to archives, to med archive, bio archive, and archive. And what you see here is the percentage of female authors. So at the start of the pandemic, you clearly see a drop in articles being submitted to med archive. Right, so immediately there were these signals, well, this pandemic is affecting people, but it also seems to affect academics in a different way. Some academics are affected in one way and others in another way. And that's why we uh, uh, decided to uh, do a study to focus on the question, how did the pandemic differently affect academic workers? Now, in order to study this, we set up a survey. Uh, uh, and this was a survey uh, uh, where all scientific employees at all 14 universities could participate in. Uh, the university medical centers did not participate uh, because we were not able to get them involved uh, soon enough uh, um, to make it work with uh, this uh, survey. Uh, the survey was fielded uh, well, a bit over a year ago. Uh, we had a bit under 6,000 respondents. And, and in the survey, we asked questions on how people divided their time, how they dealt with work-life balance, uh, whether they were stressed or burned out, what were their future prospects in academia, how did they felt about leadership under times of pandemic. Now, these are all themes uh, that I will uh, talk about uh, when I get to the results, the main results of this report and trying to map how the pandemic affected uh, uh, academics in the Netherlands. Uh, before I start, I wanna give sort of a brief overview, which you know, hopefully adds a bit of credibility to the report of who actually participated in this report. And I, I won't go over it in detail, uh, but, uh, what we found is that first, the respondent numbers were quite high. Um, so we have enough statistical power. The response rate was not very high, but similar to many of these uh, surveys, about 20%. But what we did find is that the, uh, the distribution of people in different functions was quite even to what we see in the population. So PhD candidates participated, but uh, full professors participated as well. Uh, second, uh, when we look at other demographics, we also see that there was quite a good distribution of uh, uh, groups. So uh, about the same amount of females and males participated. Uh, about one third of the respondents had children at home. Uh, and this was uh, about the same percentage for men and for women. Uh, and we see that about two thirds had the Dutch nationality. So we also have uh, international scholars. 
Okay, so uh, what I will do now is I will go over the results uh, and I will take some time to elaborate on what we found. Uh, and then after that, I will come uh, to uh, some recommendations. So let's start uh, with the results. And, and first, uh, while we don't really have a uh, strong, strong uh, interpretation of this, I think it's interesting to see how many of us actually work at home, work from home. Uh, and what you see here is the percentage of people that work from home. Uh, you see that, you know, and this is exclusively from home. So these were people that never went to university. I see that it's about 90% of people in all domains that never went to university in life sciences and in natural sciences. It is a bit uh, a lower percentage, which is most likely due to the labs. But it's clear that a large share, virtually everyone in academia was working from home. And our question is, well, how did that affect their uh, uh, academic work, their well-being? Now, the first topic that we were interested in is whether the ways in which people divided their time before and after the pandemic, or before and during the pandemic, was different. Right, so what you see here uh, are the open circles. That is how people divided their time on a five-point scale before the lockdown, and then the green squares is during the lockdown. Now, first, on many, if we just look at the full population, on, on many of these, we don't see huge differences. Slightly more time spent on management, slightly more time spent on teaching, uh, quite some time less on impact. But the biggest gap uh, is here in research, right? So we see that people, uh, uh, when uh, dividing their time uh, during this pandemic, they gave in most of uh, all on research, not so much on management, not so much on teaching, uh, and also a bit on impact. So if we look at the full population, we see gaps in research. But what we also find is that these differences, the extent to which the pandemic affected the division of time, uh, differs quite a lot among different groups in academia. So first, if you look at sort of seniority or the function that people have, the academic position that people have, uh, we see that uh, uh, when, we, when we look at management, there are actually some groups where management took more time. And here we look at the full professors, the associate professors, but also the lecturers. And the same for teaching. While we don't saw uh, very big uh, 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 differences in the full population, we do see that there are some groups, assistant and associate professors, who actually report to spend quite some time more on teaching during the pandemic than before the pandemic. Similarly, on research, everyone gave in on research, right? But here there are also differences. Again, it's the assistant and the associate professors that spend more time, uh, spend, sorry, spend less time on their research during the pandemic than before the pandemic. Uh, and finally, when we look at impact, uh, we see that it's full professors, assistant professors, and associate professors that had less time to spend on impact, on public si uh, science, on, on engagement with the public. Now, these differences are not there, uh, just there for uh, academic functions. Uh, but also, if we look at whether people have children at home or not at home, we see some quite big differences here. Uh, we don't see any differences when we look at management or teaching, right? So there, it doesn't seem to matter that much whether you are female or male or whether you have children at home, yes or no. Uh, but for research, we do see a very big difference, right? And the big difference here is between people without children and people with children. Uh, and, and here we find that people with children uh, spend about twice as uh, less time on research than people uh, without children. Right? And the people without children also lost in the research time, but the losses were bigger for those with children at home. Uh, and then, of course, the question is, well, why is this the case? Does this really have to do something with care, or is there something else going on? And in order to address that question, we looked at the ages of uh, the children at home. Um, and what you see here is, again, this research loss uh, uh, on the, on the x-axis. And the more you are to the left, the, the higher is your research loss. And what you see here is that it's particularly parents with young children, so these are children between zero and three, I get some feedback, uh, between zero and three are uh, seeing the biggest losses. Uh, then you see it for uh, uh, children four to eight and so on. And when you look at people who have children at home uh, that are 13 years or older, where the care duties are lower, we see virtually no difference between those uh, academics and academics with no children. So this, this points to us very clearly that people with heavy care duties, in this case children, uh, were given in on their time that they could spend on their work, but they did not give in equally on all tasks they have, right? They spend a bit more time on teaching, slightly more on management, but a lot less on research. 
Now, a question here is, of course, whether uh, this effect uh, um, also led to certain conflict between how people dealt with stuff at home and uh, uh, at their work. And that's what we measure when we look at the family to work conflict. We see here that indeed people with children had a much higher family to work conflict, which means that they were not being able to combine both work and family tasks uh, at the same time. And these scores are very high. And the gaps between people with children at home and children not at home are also very, very large. Um, it's important uh, to note that while we don't find very big gaps between mothers and fathers when it comes to the loss of research time, we do find that mothers experienced uh, higher um, uh, work uh, family conflict. Right? So here you again see uh, uh, the graph for uh, children in different age groups. Uh, and uh, people with the youngest children at home experienced the largest conflict, but here mothers also experienced slightly higher conflict than fathers. Uh, so that means that um, uh, whereas the loss in research time was quite similar for mothers and fathers, the effects were not so similar. Um, but of course, not only mothers and fathers were affected by the pandemic. Many people had stress about different things, right? So a lot of us uh, in academia were stressed about our research progress. And those were not just people uh, uh, that were assistant professors or full professors. It were mostly uh, people uh, in, the, in their early career, PhD students, postdocs, who felt worries about uh, whether they uh, were making enough progress with their research. For teaching, uh, we also find that this was a big stressor for basically three groups, lecturers, uh, assistant professors, and associate professors. So those with most likely the, heavy the, the most heavy teaching tasks also felt uh, a lot of stress about uh, these tasks during the lockdown. Um, people tend to be overworked in academia. That's nothing new. Uh, but here we also see that some groups uh, uh, felt that they have more work than others. And here again, the lecturers pop out, but also assistant professors and associate professors. If we then look at future in academia, it's not surprising that, that full professors are not that worried about their, um, uh, about their uh, future in academia. But there is a lot of stress among young academics, right? Uh, and a, a, a mean score for postdocs of 3.64, uh, that's just a lot. Um, and we see that too when we look at their worries about employment in the future. These worries are big for some groups, particularly for postdocs and lecturers. For other groups, there were uh, differences in, in stress too. If we look at Dutch scholars and scholars without the Dutch nationality, we see over the over the whole uh, uh, over all the items that, on average, scholars without the Dutch nationality felt higher levels of stress about many things, about their future in academia, but also about their research progress and about, um, uh, for example, their employment in the future. Finally, if we look at stress and parenthood. Uh, we, uh, uh, I think there's one thing that we need to sort of highlight here is that whereas, again, we didn't find big differences in the actual research time that respondents said to have lost between fathers and mothers, we do see that mothers uh, tend to be more stressed when it concerns their research progress. But also when it comes to working from home, again, highlighting this family work conflict that is different for men and women having too much work and finally their future in academia here we really see that it is women with children at home uh, that experience most stress about their future in academia um, early career uh, acad uh, academics phds postdocs and people on the tenure track experienced quite large delays uh, about uh, uh, half of them in all these groups says that they have uh, uh, experienced delays in finalizing their progress or finalizing their uh, recommendations for the tenure track we also find that about 40% of them felt hampered, felt unable to apply for research grants, whereas we know that it's so crucial in that career stage that they're able to do that. And this effect, this inability to apply for grants was stronger for young academics with children. Finally, to what extent did the pandemic affect leadership? And here we see that um, uh, uh, leaders on average uh, uh, found their management more difficult during the pandemic. So it was difficult for early career uh, academics. It was difficult for people with care duties at home, but it certainly wasn't easy for people who were maybe a bit more at the top of the pyramid leading the universities during this pandemic. They found management more difficult, more stressful. Uh, and sometimes uh, they did not felt enough support for their organization. And of course, here is something to gain, because how can we make sure that leaders can feel more support during this pandemic? Because we started this study feeling that it was one closure, 
then another school closure came, another lockdown. And after that lockdown, we felt now it's over, but it seems as if, you know, the pandemic isn't over yet. So we need to think about how we can deal with this in a more structural way. Okay, briefly go over my key findings and then I'll get to four recommendations. So first of all, everyone lost time, mostly in research, right? I think it's important to make this point. It's not just people with children who lost time in research, it's also people without children that gave in on their research time, although on average, less. Uh, these losses are unequally divided. On average, parents are hit harder. Uh, this is uh, both for mothers and fathers the case, and this effect is stronger when children are younger. And for us, this highlights the importance of care duties, that it's mostly people with high care duties that see a large loss in their research time. And this could also be other care duties that we didn't, um, uh, 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 that we didn't address in our survey. There's a large work to family conflict for parents, uh, but it's higher for mothers than for fathers, right? But it's clear that it was very difficult to combine the private life and the work life during this pandemic. There are high levels of stress. Uh, uh, we find higher levels of stress for mothers and for non-Dutch academics. And we also find that the stressors are different for early and late career economics. Uh, early, career, uh, 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 early career academics are mostly worried about their future in academia, about their research progress. Late career workers are more stressed about having too much work. Finally, we find that these were challenging times for leadership. Now, in the final uh, uh, two minutes, uh, I want to uh, take some time to uh, discuss uh, the key recommendations that we have based on, uh, on this report. And, and before I want to get to these recommendations, I find it important to show this figure, because we also asked our respondents, well, this is how you divide your time. But what is actually important when it comes to your next appraisal, to your next promotion, to your next jaargesprek, to your next whatever? And here we find that these four domains are not equally important, right? And completely in line with the uh, uh, recognition and rewards um, uh, uh, agenda that's being laid out and, and that, that, that sort of that, that, um, works being done there. We find that people are mostly being appraised based on their research and much less on their teaching, management, and impact. Now, of course, we find that research is the domain where people mostly gave in and where we also see that people gave in in an unequal way. So we believe that when thinking about how to deal with, um, uh, with uh, the effects of the pandemic, uh, we can't avoid also thinking about how we are evaluating these four domains, these four pillars of our academic work differently uh, in the Dutch universities. And so we have four recommendations and I'm very curious on your opinions on these uh, recommendations. So first, uh, prevent a brain drain, drain, invest in talent retention. Uh, so we, got, we, we believe that it's clear that people have gave in in research time, right? And it's clear that people have given in research time in an unequal way, which means that if we want to balance this out, if we want to give people some time, some opportunities to uh, you know, to create sort of more uh, a level playing ground. We need to make uh, scholars, we need to let scholars make up for their unequal losses in research time somehow, right? And we need to take this unequal situation that people have been having during uh, uh, the pandemic, we need to take it into account when we think about promotions, when we think about hiring, but also when we think about grants, right? So we have this sort of, uh, this uh, uh, effective research month that uh, NWO is using to, uh, see how much basically you would expect to do with respect to research in your research time. And we think that when we look at the pandemic, this is something to take into account. People did not have the same effective research time during this pandemic. Finally, extensions for younger researchers might be necessary so that they can actually finish their research project and enter the academic labor market in a better and more well-prepared way. Second, we feel that it is important to adapt and reconsider hiring and promotion criteria. So within HRM, within universities, we need to discuss the effect of the pandemic on all domains of academic work, because ironically, um, uh, uh, the domains where people have spent more time on teaching and management are amongst the ones that are evaluated least, right? And this means that when we think about how the pandemic hit uh, uh, academic work and what we can do about this. This is something that we need to discuss internally when we're in promotion committees in our faculties, in our universities. Uh, and second, we believe that for people on a tenure track, instead of extending these tenure tracks, we need to adapt the criteria for these tenure tracks and take into account that people had a difficult time. 
some people more difficult than others and adjust the criteria uh, to uh, uh, those uh, situations of these people. Third, we feel that it's important now more than maybe ever to promote leadership development and support leaders within the universities. Leadership is not something that's being evaluated very highly. Uh, many people do not want to take leadership positions, but at the same time, we see that during the pandemic, it was a struggle to be a leader, which means that it is important to support them, to help them out and to let them develop uh, their leadership skills in a serious way. So that has also become a serious pillar in academic work. And finally, um, it remains important to monitor the effects of the pandemic. We only looked at the first lockdown, but as Bettina started and Natalie started saying, you know, the effects are ongoing and we need to think about how this is affecting academic work, not just then, but also now. And in order to do that, it remains very important to keep looking at the effects of the pandemic. Um, so those are our four recommendations. I'm very curious to hear what you think about uh, the report and about uh, the findings, the recommendations. Um, yeah, I'm open for all questions. Thank you so much, Dice, for this presentation. And thank you to you and to your co-authors, of course, Beta Derricks and Liebling Portaj for preparing this wonderful report. And I also noticed that Liebling has already started answering questions in the chat, which is wonderful. There may also be some questions in the Q&A that um, are of more general interest or require a more reflective answer. So I just want to quickly hand over um, to Natalie, who has been monitoring the Q&A and who can maybe um, put forward a few of those questions that have been asked there so far. Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks. Thank, thank you for this really important and, and co-authors, thanks for this really important report and insights. And um, I, I think um, many of the insights speak many out of our hearts. And, and we recognize ourselves in this. Um, there were a couple of questions on the methodology uh, that you used. And I saw that Lidewein has already started answering then. And maybe that is that is actually the, the best uh, way uh, to deal with those. Um, there were quite some questions also on the, um, the differences between parents and non-parents. And for example, if you consider differences between Dutch and non-Dutch parents, so if there is extra differentiation um, yeah. and um, differences between females with kids and Dutch, and, yeah, so there were two positions and also in terms of their stage of the career. So I think that was, um, that, that, that was a, a question, we, uh, we've seen these two variations. And then um, there was already started already some discussion about the um, the recommendations that you pose. For example, um, the uh, suggestion to get extension, and to some extent, this had already happened also at universities. I know that the uh, University of Amsterdam we we try to extend PhDs, um, but. Um, Marty van Gelder is pointing out that actually compensating people on a permanent contract is much more difficult because where would the money come from? Yeah. So I will. Can I take up some of these questions and address yes. them? Uh, yeah. So uh, let me start with Marty's question, which I think is a great question and something that I didn't mention explicitly here, which we do mention in the report. So I'm, I'm now going to take that opportunity to mention this, uh, which is that some of the recommendations that we do are not possible under the current funding structure of Dutch universities, right? So it means that. Um, uh, for some of these recommendations, extra funding is needed. And this is in line with the report of PricewaterhouseCoopers of a year ago, uh, which is saying that there is structural underfunding in Dutch universities. So of course, if you want to give people more research time with the permanent contract, that money needs to come from somewhere, right? And, and that means that if we want to take this serious, uh, then we need funding for this. This is not something you can just put at universities and let them solve it, uh, because currently there's not enough funding for these things. Uh, for extensions, I agree that sometimes extensions were possible, although my experience, at least also from our WhatsApp group within the Young Academy, is that these arrangements have been quite different across different universities and also quite arbitrary. Some people got more, uh, more extensions than others or longer extensions than others. Uh, and for postdocs, it turned out that it's actually quite difficult to give them any uh, extensions, but this is also due to uh, labor law. Um, then uh, the, the question on the different groups. Um, so this is, of course, a, a, a difficulty uh, in the report where at some point we have to zoom in on specific groups and you can go further and further and saying, well, you know, how is it for a PhD who is non-Dutch, who has a child between zero and three and who is female, right? At that level, our data are not strong enough anymore because we don't have enough observations to make very uh, uh, valid statements on this. 
Uh, so all the things that we report in our report are the things that where we find the biggest differences, which also means that we don't find big differences between parents who are non-Dutch and Dutch, for example. Uh, um, uh, and um, uh, uh, we also uh, don't find that big differences. Um, uh, let me take the other question uh, uh, between uh, parents. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, between male and female kids, that's not controlled for petition uh, in early career positions. We don't find very big differences there. So we estimated it. At some point, nothing of this was significant any anymore. But if you zoom in more and more, the question is also whether it's not significant because it's not there or whether we just don't have enough observations to really make these fine-grained comparisons. Uh, so looking deeper there is definitely possible. But we believe that the, the sort of the lines we put out here are the most important ones. Thank you so much, Tais. Uh, um, the, the questions keep coming in, so I'll, I'll just hand it back to Natalie for more summary of questions. Yeah, questions and compliments also for the report um, uh, from, uh, from various uh, commentators. Um, there is also some uh, discussion of extensions as a solution, and, 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 and for, there's a recommendation, for example, to uh, uh, adapt a more differentiated approach based on opting out by uh, Klaatje Finkenburg. Um, there's another suggestion, actually, and probably also a question to you, whether um, actually you will continue doing this monitoring work also after the pandemic is out. So um, does it take a pandemic to look into the working conditions for academics or uh, can we then make this something more structural? And um, then um, thanks, Martje, for, for that question. And there are um, two questions that ask you to dive deeper onto the uh, implications you found for leaders and what actually is needed to get leaders up to speed as Anna Tisseling. And um, yeah, how can we prepare future leaders for, for situations like these and, and for continuing because the pandemic is not over yet? Yeah, so some of them I find very difficult to answer because I'm not a leadership expert, right? So. Um, uh, 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 I, I, I would be hesitant to now give like an answer to say this type of leadership style would help you through the pandemic because I'm not an expert on this. I do think that it's clear that we need to look into leadership as well, that we shouldn't take leadership for granted uh, and that this is a question that needs to be asked. But I think someone else needs to answer this question on what is effective, because based on our report, it's very difficult uh, uh, to uh, uh, actually uh, say something uh, about this. Um, one question that I think uh, is very interesting is the um, uh, is the question by uh, uh, Ruth van Vela. I was reading I was reading question. It's a long question, but it's a question we talked about. Uh, I think a lot, uh, and I, I agree with uh, with her, her her question there. The question is well, you know, self reporting might uh, be gendered, uh, uh, which means that women might under report uh, uh, compared to men. Uh, um, and, and I agree, right? So it might be that effective loss and research time is actually different for men and women, although we don't find it. Uh, particularly because the stress levels, the family to work conflict and so on, they are different for men and women. Uh, and I also talked to Mara about this at some point, Mara Jerkes, who work on this. And, and, and so here we are wondering, well, whether, whether the findings that we have here are specific for people in academia, because it is a different group of people uh, than uh, Mara Jerkes has studied in her research on COVID. Uh, or whether it has something to do with the measurement. And this is a very difficult question. So while I think the report is very important because it shows that when we look at self-reported losses in research time, self-reported division of tasks, we see these differences uh, between parents and non-parents, small difference between men and women. Of course, the real question is what happens with behavior, right? And, and behavior can be either publishing, getting, getting grants, but could also be leaving academia. And that is why we feel that it's so important to keep tracking the effects, not just in how people perceived uh, the uh, pandemic, but also how they now might adjust their actual behavior. Uh, and in order to do that, to get to the first question, it is super important to keep on monitoring these questions and to keep a monitor like this running. At the same time, for uh, Lidwin, Bella and myself, it, was, it took quite some time. And uh, we said yes to this. Uh, we thought this was important. And then we felt the schools would never close again. And we were you know, starting to work on this report. And then in December, everything closed down again uh, last year. Uh, so for us, it was also difficult to combine these things. But, but uh, you know, for the uh, for the phase new, 
uh, uh, for sort of the ministry, I think it's super important to keep repeating a survey like this continuously to keep tracking what's happening in the field. Uh, because the effects of the pandemic are not just now. I think potentially the biggest effects of the pandemic are in a few years where we might see that people are selectively leaving academia or choosing for different careers and we lose talent. Thank you so much, Thais. Um, Nathalie, is there one more round of questions from the, um, uh, from the Q&A that we want to do uh, right now? I think we have just about time for one or two more questions. Yeah, there. Although I also saw Victor um, uh, getting up his. No, Victor's hand. question is is solved. Ah, it's solved. Okay. Um, yes, there are uh, many more um, questions. Um, I, I think some are really difficult to know answer. As as the uh, question I already mentioned himself, please ciao. Um, because I mean, um, the, a lot of the uh, solutions to the that were offered so far were piecemeal, and how can we keep up the pressure on the powers to be to make the structural structural changes that need to happen? So I think we're all very curious if you have any ideas on that one. Um, we we'll keep talking about in the second half, right? But and yeah. that is also something indeed we're going to answer in the in the second one. Thank you a lot, Claudia, for um, your um, pointer to uh, an interesting publication on um, impact on leadership. And I think that also shows the power of the combined expertise in this um, in this uh, group that we uh, can help each other out with finding answers. Um, and um, there is also a request for you if you would like to share the PowerPoint. Yeah, sure. I think everything is being recorded, but I, I'm, I'm happy to share the PowerPoint. I will, I will remove the photo of my kids, of course, but other than that, I'm happy to share the PowerPoint. Uh, and and to, briefly, to briefly touch upon this one question before we, we go on, um, uh, um, I, I do think that just like in many areas, if you look at things that happen in education, things happening in society in general, we do see that uh, uh, sort of what, what, what COVID is sort of a magnifying glass. You get all these horrible metaphors that we've heard so often already. Um, uh, but, but I think in academia, it's the same too, right? So we see groups that are already vulnerable, early career academics, people on temporary contracts are being hit hardest. And uh, in that sense, I do think that I hope the pandemic and also the report might help at least a bit to put this really on the agenda and show that this is not something that people are making up, but these are real groups that are uh, working in precarity and we might lose out on talent. And of course, in solving this, it doesn't, doesn't help to do something only with a pandemic. The causes that are under, under this are often more structural. And that's also one of the reasons why we, in the report, try to connect this to recognition and rewards, because these two things are not, you know, are not uh, uh, separable from each other. Thank you so much. I suggest we leave the reports for now. Thais is going to stick around and is going to uh, keep answering questions in the uh, Q&A um, as much as he can until he has to leave to teach at three. Um, but what he just said was very important. Um, there are real people behind <laughs> these numbers. Um, and let's, let's hear from these real people. Um, and I want to first um, give the word to Megan Pollack, who is the chair of the PhD Network Netherlands and is herself a PhD researcher at the Department of Surgery at the Leida University Medical Hospital. So, um, Me Megan, please take it away. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'll share my screen. So, hey, you see it. Okay, uh, well, thanks also uh, to Thijs Bol and on behalf of him, the uh, De Jong Academy and LNVH. We wholeheartedly agree with your very clear um, well, presentation and your report. So thank you for highlighting some of those and the recommendations. I hope this won't be too much of a repetition. I first want to start with a brief background of PNN uh, and the PhDs. So we are a national interest group for PhD candidates in the Netherlands since 1987, and our members are the local PhD representative organizations at the Dutch Institutes, and we're currently with nine board members, uh, daily board, labor commissions, and recognition and rewards, also already briefly mentioned by Thijs. Uh, short organograms on the one hand with PhD candidates who are then formed into councils, and then the PhD organizations, and those are the members of us. And we then have horizontal contact, for instance, with Young Science in Transition, 
But we also have contact with the Young Academy and also the LNVH and the KNW. And then we have more vertical contacts with the VZNU, the NFU, the Ministry of Education, Culture and Science and some members of Parliament. And in general, well, this is a bit short in a nutshell, but we have like the standard PhDs employed by the PhD awarding institution, protected by collective labor agreement and uh, advocation hours and such. And then you have a non-standard PhDs, uh, including for instance, the bursary PhDs and external PhDs. And the VZNU has, has a more uh, ex, ex, um, extended categorization, but this is more in a nutshell. And the VZNU is also busy now collecting numbers because we currently do not know exactly how many PhDs there are in the Netherlands, but roughly around 10,000 standard and 10,000 non-standard PhDs. And then you have a different group, the international PhDs, and they can have all different contract forms. They can have be like a normal, regular employee candidate, or they can have an external uh, scholarship, for instance, from China or India. And in general, short rules, you have a contract for about three or four years. You have to be registered at a graduate school, have to at least have two supervisors, uh, a training and supervision plan, and of course your dissertation is, for instance, a monograph or consisting of articles. And next to that, you also have coursework or you have to do teaching. So busy schedule. And that was, uh, well, in normal times, and of course COVID came, and uh, I'll start with the first, yeah, uh, personal uh, side, and then talk a little bit more in general, also a little bit repeating what Dai said. So I started my PhD at the Department of Surgery in LUMC in May 2020. So it's right smack in the middle of the uh, pandemic. And uh, so it was already with the application, it was really uh, difficult doing uh, through Zoom. Many of, uh, of us already know that. And uh, also starting, like you, you weren't allowed in the hospital uh, because of the COVID pandemic. So starting off, it was really like figure out even more than, than usual, uh, what to do, how to uh, uh, attack your, your uh, trajectory. And I, had, I was very lucky to have very nice uh, colleagues who sort of welcomed me with open arms and we had like coffee moments online and stuff like that. So I was really lucky, but um, I will tell you a little bit more about the uh, challenges because many were so lucky. Um, well, Thais already mentioned the delays are very, very um, uh, well present. Uh, this figure shows um, uh, some of the problems. In March 2020, uh, uh, PNN did a large survey uh, filled in by 1,600 PhDs in the whole of the Netherlands. And also because the uh, pandemic was a little bit starting, we had a couple of questions regarding this. And these also illustrate actually what Thais already also showed in his uh, presentation, but specifically the delays were very, uh, well, also uh, mentally and making motivation and concentration very uh, difficult. Also working from home, balancing uh, your, for instance, your kids at home, uh, but also then on the other hand, feeling socially isolated um, and, and with the delays also, uh, initiating contract insecurities, like how am I going to finish my dissertation on time? And uh, well, the, the extensions also uh, have had wide varieties between, but also inside the institutions themselves um, with no really uh, uh, yeah, uh, rules or regulations regarding that. Um, and this is even bigger in the international PhD candidates group. So. Uh, in our survey, the uh, distribution was about that 40% of our, uh, the people who responded were international PhDs. And they, uh, well, of course, there were already pre-existing a lot of problems with COVID sort of put like the magnifying glass on it. And uh, they experienced the same challenges, but actually uh, they, those challenges have more impact on them. So, of course, sometimes they come from temporary housing, working in a small, not so nicely uh, um, uh, organized housing temporarily, perhaps no possibility of going home or being stuck there and not coming back, uh, being socially isolated on top of having that big culture shock and language barrier they already mentioned having. And of course, the contract insecurities and specifically for international PhDs, sometimes when you have a scholarship or a grant, you have to 
be uh, very productive. You have to publish articles um, and uh, sometimes extensions. It's, it's not really clear whether that also goes for them or is their home country is going to pay for it. So that's a big problem for them as well. And that means that their, their financial uh, and mental struggles, which were, of course, already happening, specifically in this already vulnerable group, uh, were, were very intense. So like one in five uh, international PhDs had financial troubles uh, and mental struggles, which were, of course, also in the national group already present, were almost two thirds. It's, it's very, um, yeah, very um, a big problem for them. And of course, uh, it was also in the media a couple of uh, months ago, like the Chinese, uh, but also a lot of other uh, PhD candidates, their grant is sometimes less than minimum wage. And specifically if you have a family to support or housing to uh, uphold, then it's, it's really stressful. And um, on top of that, a lot of the international PhDs uh, mentioned that they had no help with integration at all or not experienced that while two thirds of those people would have wanted it. So that's also really, uh, well, stressful for those people, of course, and adding to the already very high amounts of burnout and uh, not psychiatric illnesses, such as depression or general anxiety. So those are really, well, sort of shocking numbers. And um, I think now looking more to a positive note, I mean, of course, we all know the troubles, but we also have like lessons learned, like realization that, um, research in general for society is very important, like the vaccination and all the research that was pumped into that, but the flexibility as well, also for the society, but the researchers and specifically like the involvement, like what I also experienced with my colleagues, but also the international colleagues reaching out, uh, like those small moments, like the coffee online moments. I mean, it's small, but it really helps a lot. Um, so those are things that really, um, added to uh, the lessons learned and well potential solutions and Thais already mentioned uh, a little bit but the extension so uh, the government had issued a financial aid uh, through the national programma onderwijs uh, a large sum of money and this includes uh, specifically for PhDs but also I think a part postdocs please correct me if I'm wrong uh, a small sum of money earmarked specifically for the delays due to COVID for researchers on temporary contracts. Uh, and we are as PNN, we're in the monitoring board there as well. Um, so this is a large sum of money for all education throughout the whole of the Netherlands, but also as PNN, we keep uh, together with our members, the local uh, PhD organizations. We hope to keep an eye on that, on the allocation. Um, and also the recognition awards, like the, the new movement of the Face New NFU, Zonabe, NBO, just to, uh, realize that researchers need to be more complete researchers and not uh, focus purely on the bibliometric output uh, measures such as the, the citation indexes and publishing more articles, but more uh, future proof and uh, research and knowledge climate in the Netherlands. And um, what Thijs already mentioned, like the uh, being afraid that people leave academia, that is already happening. People are massively just choosing to not actively pursue a career in the academia due to already a high, uh, uh, well, high workload, the intense culture, uh, already not that many jobs uh, or being like a disposable uh, teacher. So those are already things that the recognition and rewards movement is trying to pick up on, focusing more on a narrative CV. And I think, or as PNN, we also think that that is, could be the first step um, Next to, of course, more money, thanks to the PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, uh, document, which was uh, published. And I think, well, on that note, uh, hopeful note, uh, uh, that will be all. And if there are any questions, please let me know. Uh, contact me or uh, us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan, for that uh, very uh, great presentation and especially the, the hopeful note and the sort of constructive ideas for how to move forwards and for um, highlighting the particular problems of international PhD students, which I think are a group that we really should, must keep in mind when we look at these things. I'm going to hand straight over to Kari Bosch, um, who is a PhD researcher in cognitive neurosciences at the Donders Institute at the Radboud Universiteit Nijmegen. And um, she's going to tell us more specifically what happened with her research and her work when the pandemic hit. 
Yes, thank you for the introduction, Athena. I'll start sharing my screen. Right. Um, so hello, everyone. And uh, today I'll be sharing some of my experiences as a junior researcher trying to um, work in the midst of a pandemic. So um, I recently went into the fourth and final year of my PhD program, which means that basically I've been doing most of my research um, during the current pandemic. So a little bit about my research. Um, my research area is cognitive neuroscience. And my research specifically focuses on uh, major depressive disorder and the improvement of our knowledge on existing antidepressants. And to do this, I use uh, a translational approach, which means that I uh, use experimental animals. And I think, as a lot of people here know, um, experiments with animals are extremely well regulated which means that um, every experiment is basically preceded by months and months of planning and scheduling. And you have to, of course, gain ethical approval. So there's a lot of paperwork to do as well. And on top of that, some researchers are also working with uh, transgenic animals that need to be bred, which is a process that um, takes a bit of time and also a bit of luck. Um, so all in all, these factors makes, make, make this type of research very sensitive uh, to any kind of delay. Um, and especially, of course, for the junior researchers who are on temporary contracts, um, any kind of delay can have huge consequences. And I think it's great that now um, three month extensions are being granted. I think that's amazing. But if I'm being realistic, I'm not sure that everyone will gain much from that. So uh, for me personally, when the pandemic hit, um, I was on the brink of starting a large um, animal experiment. So as I work with models of chronic stress, uh, this means that the type of experiments that I perform can be quite long. So uh, a single experiment can last three to four months easily. Um, and uh, the pandemic, of course, started with a lot of uncertainty, which meant that uh, my experiments actually got put on hold for a bit, because in the animal facility, we, of course, needed to figure out um, how, on one hand, they could still accommodate researchers performing their experiments, while on the other hand, also, um, uh, of course, making sure that everyone was adhering to the necessary restrictions. So we were dealing with a designated walking routes, maximum numbers of people per room, but also in the total unit. And also, uh, of course, regulations on who was actually allowed to be present at the lab. So for instance, uh, bachelor students and master students who usually help researchers uh, with the performance of their experiments, they were not allowed to be there. Um, and for me personally, that meant that not only was my experiment delayed, but I also needed to figure out how I would be able to perform it without the full-time assistant of a student. And of course, for my students, that was also uh, quite a bummer because she had to uh, do her internship without getting any practical experience in the lab. I couldn't really make any big changes to the experiment because then I would have to do the paperwork and get additional approval. And I also couldn't really postpone it uh, because for my follow-up experiments, I was depending on the results of this experiment. So for me, this was uh, not the easiest time. It was uh, quite a struggle, but um, I'm also very aware that there are people around me who had it worse, definitely. So I know a PhD student who actually got COVID and she was ill for a solid uh, three months. And on top of that, she was supposed to go abroad to conduct interviews, um, but of course that was also not possible then. So she ended up having to reconsider her entire project plan. And of course the consequences did not just relate to purely work because uh, of course, as is already mentioned, there's international students who come here um, in the middle of the pandemic and they don't know the Netherlands any different than a country in the middle of a pandemic. And they've been really trying to meet people and get to know people, 
But of course, it's difficult right now because as a PhD, you have a lot of freedom uh, because you are in charge of your own project, which is great. Um, but even at regular times, uh, this can be quite a lonely work environment. And I have to say in Nijmegen, we have a really nice PhD culture and normally lots of social activities are being planned. Um, but of course, now for a while already, these activities have all been online. And as we all know, online meetings are not a valid substitute for actual human interaction. Anyhow, so far I've uh, been focusing mainly on the negative effects, but of course, um, as my research has actually taught me, it's also good to focus on the positive aspects uh, every now and then. Um, so for this, I would like to go back to the restrictions that we had to uh, adhere to in our lab and the measures that we used. Um, so I think the most impactful measure that we had to deal with in our animal lab was uh, the limited amount of people that could be in the lab at the same time. So um, at one point, um, next to the animal caretakers, only 10 researchers were allowed to be present on the floor simultaneously. So the coordinators of the unit, they made this online schedule where you could register for morning slots and afternoon slots. But of course, um, there were too many people signing up. So then um, between the different research groups that were signing up to use the facility, we had to decide, uh, we had to divide the slots equally. And then also the researchers within each group had to decide amongst each other um, under discussion with their supervisors who would get priority for the slots. And this led to quite some arguments, as you can imagine, um, because uh, there are people like me who perform long-term experiments and who basically already know what they'll be doing on the third Tuesday of the month, uh, three months from now. But there are also people who perform more short-term experiments and who are more um, dependent on um, more um, short notice, basically, for the planning of their experiments. So um, usually the people who are already running an experiment would get priority over people who would want to start a new experiment. But as there were only that many slots, of course, that also became problematic. And after a while, uh, researchers, they could start sharing the slots, which meant that people were no longer bound to morning or afternoon specifically, but they could alternate. And as long as only one of them was on the floor at the same time, uh, then it was still according to all the restrictions. And um, I think this has definitely taught us or it has forced us to learn to be more flexible and also to help each other. And I think in the end, this has led to definitely an increased feeling of cohesion within and between the research groups using the facility, uh, which I think is a very good thing. And I think we should also focus on maintaining this feeling of cohesion, especially with an eye on, you know, this kind of situation uh, possibly occur occurring again in the future. Um, so all in all, I, I guess I have to say it's not all bad. Um, and personally, I have to say that I have to count myself lucky that I've had really nice coworkers and uh, the animal caretakers and also the animal welfare body who are all very eager to think along and also help where necessary. And of course, it also helps uh, to have supervisors who look out for you, basically. And these were my personal experiences. And if anyone has questions, um, I would happy, happily answer them. Thank you or your time. Thank you so much, Kari. And um, of course, you can all ask uh, Megan or Kari questions in the in the Q&A and where they will be able to answer them. And we'll come back to some general points at, in the closing discussion at the end of this. Thank you so much. I thought it was wonderful, especially how you focused on how we can make things better if we see research as a sort of collaborative effort and we help each other out. Um, a little better anyway. Um, okay, moving on from early career to mid-career researchers, I'd like to give the word to Viktor Szymanski, who is an associate professor of radiological chemistry at the University Medical uh, Hospital in Groningen and at the Leipzig University Groningen. Thank you, Tina. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, just to confirm, can you see my slides and hear me? Yes, both. Super. Thank you. So uh, thanks for inviting me, and uh, I would like to give you our, uh, or, or my very personal 
perspective on uh, on this topic, just as a background and to position me a bit in this uh, in those different graphs from the report that we have seen in the beginning of this meeting. I'm associate professor in actually two different places at the hospital at and also the University of Groningen. Uh, I am married. My wife is working four days a week, and we have a five-year-old son who is at school. Right, so. Uh, uh, we were hit quite strongly on this on this uh, paternal side, let's say, or you know, of, of having to care for children and uh, and work at the same time. Uh, I'm a chemist. I work on synthesis of light activated drugs, uh, and my work, my personal work, is around seventy percent uh, of things you can do from home. Well, maybe eighty percent, including presentation, and then some in person teaching and lab work is around twenty percent. For my students, masters, PhDs, postdocs, it's a bit the reverse. They have to do 70% lab work and, well, 30% of, of things that you can do offsite. Uh, the profile of our group is around 70% international, 30% Dutch. Uh, so when when pandemic hit, uh, we were hit in ways that uh, I will describe in a second. But first, maybe the important message to send. This is our workplace. And this, this kind of plugs in also very much to what Kari said. Uh, we work on site. This is our laboratory. This is where students normally work. Uh, and the main message from this is we cannot do this at home. Uh, try to do what we do at home and you will probably blow your head off or get a chemical poisoning very quickly. Uh, so when we are off site, we cannot generate data. That's it. Our research stops when the universities are closed. Important thing to know is uh, the, the way our PhD works is they usually would work on around 10 projects or so during their trajectory. And they are all very uh, crazy ideas, I have to say. So around half of them will, will fail. I say here two to four, it's, it's quite optimistic. It will just simply not work. That's it, the, the idea was too crazy. Some of them will become papers and that those are the most successful ones which then get translated to chapters in the thesis. Some of them will be only chapters because they're not you know, exciting enough to, uh, to be published, but they are still good, good science and they can go in, right? So uh, a PhD student during their trajectory has to come up with something around four, four manuscripts uh, and uh, make chapters out of them, make an introduction chapter and that's, that's the thesis. Um, so, Pandemics hit, I myself uh, found myself having to take over the caring of our son uh, because as I said, my wife also works four days a week. So we split our week four to three. Uh, my wife was working four days a week. I was doing Wednesdays, Saturdays and Sundays plus evenings were, were mine, uh, which is obviously not, not optimal. Uh, I had to learn to lecture online, but it's, it's something that you, we all went through. Uh, having to juggle slides and whiteboards because we still draw molecules by hand, uh, handle chat rooms with 400 people's, uh, people while, while we're teaching. So um, it was all, let's say, you know, challenges on our time, challenges on our skills, challenges on our, our techniques. But the most important challenges, uh, the challenges on our emotions came from what, what Megan and Kai described from, let's say, the other side. And it was the well being of our PhD students and postdocs who suddenly found themselves in complete uncertainty situation about their research that they couldn't do anymore. And we just heard from Kai how, how this looks like, uh, leading to uncertainty about the things that they need the most in four years' time, which is papers, chapters, and skills. Uh, for foreign people, as we heard already, loneliness kicked in, missing home, having parents in you know, in China or wherever, uh, being afraid of their well-being, not being always able to come home to help their parents, uh, their parents going through COVID, right? And you're the only child and you cannot be there, right? And they desperately needed answers about the security. Uh, research is insecure anyways, right? We, we don't know what's gonna work or not and how much is gonna work. And so if you're on top of that, at this kind of drama, this is, this is overwhelming. And they desperately needed answers that we as their supervisors didn't have, simple as that. So PhD is a stressful time in life anyway, and we need to support them as much as we can. And now they needed support that we simply not always could, could deliver. So what we did never, nevertheless 
is we try to shift people to wrapping up their papers, chapters, reviews, etc. cetera, uh, which is good if you're on third year and you generated some data and now you finally have some time to write it up, but that's a not sustainable solution. You can do it only for limited amount of time before you run out of data and you need to generate new ones. We simulated people to take this time to do courses in our graduate school. We have some fantastic courses, for example, publishing in English or writing your thesis in Word. They're really useful. They can be done online and that's a good time to, to do that if you're locked at home. We organized Borels with, with my lab. So 10 to 15 people, we met every Friday. Uh, people got proper intoxicated every time somebody was showing their apartment to every to, to the whole group, giving us a tour through their sometimes, you know, four by four meters living space, uh, had lots of laughs. We tried to meet every day for coffee at 3 p.m. And it was important for me also to see who's not joining because people were falling out. And this, this sends you an important message that something might not be that going that well. So we tried reaching out to those who are falling out, uh, heading into individual meetings with them, which were open, very emotional, tears involved, hopefully supportive for us as supervisors, emotionally draining, that for sure. So uh, looking to the future, what has worked? Writing up of chapters, papers, introductions, reviews, fine, that, that worked. It's not sustainable for a few months, you can do it. Actually, 2021 is my best publishing year of my life, simply because we are just you know, wrapping up all stuff. It means that next years are gonna be much worse because we haven't generated data for, for publishing in next years. Uh, useful courses that people can take that, that seem to be a good idea. And you know, once they do it now, they don't have to do it later. Uh, and can spend this time on the, on actual research. Uh, I was extremely lucky. My uh, my department paid a proper, expensive individual leadership coaching course for me. Uh, six months, every two weeks, meeting individually with my with my coach and going through heavy stuff, uh, personal stuff, and you know, this helped. Uh, this taught me a lot. This gave me a lot. Uh, it's. If we can do that for everyone in that situation, that will be great. Extension for PhD projects. That's, we in the end, we often got them, but what didn't work was the fact that when this all started and the whole uh, uncertainty hit, we didn't know about you know, the, the, the extensions, how they're gonna work. Are we getting any? Is this time lost? Will, will the people be getting their papers, chapters in time to, to make it, yeah? Uh, so, then we started getting information. Yes, there will be extensions. Okay, everybody happy. A week later, well, yes, but only for people on institute money, right? So how about the people unhappy? And then a week later, well, actually, no, there will be no extensions. And so on, and so on, and so on. So there was lots of misinformation, lots of uh, insecurity about this one as well. Uh, so this would really help if we had a very clear set set of rules. The moment I took a person out of lab, I should be able to tell them, whatever time I'm taking you off the lab, you will be given back, yeah? And one solution fits all attitude. It would be very difficult to define, but I think there are people who due to the nature of their work are more affected by labs being closed than, than PhDs in, in other areas in which you don't need experimental work. But that's, uh, I feel I'm opening a can of worms here. Um, so it won't be easy, but probably solution one, 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 one solution fits all attitude will will not help. And finally, uh, what I would like to say, I'm sorry, I actually have a pretty bad cold, which I just found out is not COVID. Uh, so what will definitely not work? There was ideas around that, and I see they are not in the report of the ties presented, I'm very happy with that, is lowering the requirements for PhD positions. This is not about tenure tracks, this is about PhD positions, in which we don't give people extensions, but we lower the criteria. This is a really bad idea. Let's not do that. Uh, for reasons I can discuss with you at length uh, during Q&A session. Thank you so much. I hope this is in some way informative. This is super informative, Victor. Uh, I could say more, but
for reasons of time, I will just say thank you from the bottom of my heart and uh, pass, uh, uh, pass this on immediately to Antonia Fischer, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Arts at the University of Groningen. So if you, Victor, could stop sharing your screen, then Tony Fischer could share her screen and tell us something about the challenges that uh, leaders were faced by during the pandemic. Thank you very much, Bettina, and thank you uh, to all the others who organized this uh, beautiful meeting. I will not share my screen because I didn't take the risk of making a PowerPoint because I couldn't be here to test it. Uh, uh, I have a very full schedule today, so I thought I will just tell you something, and uh, um, probably that is not, uh, not so bad uh, after a lot of PowerPoints, I hope, at least. Um, I recognize, let me start by, by uh, congratulating you on the report, because I think it makes a lot of things very clear that um, as a dean of a, of a big faculty um, uh, with uh, more than 5,000 5, students and more than 700 staff members, I recognized uh, in advance a lot. Um, so, so it is good to have that in a systematic way, the figures, and it is also good to, uh, to make that clear to our government. So I recognize those negative outcomes um, and, and, and I will not go into them again because we heard them a lot. Also in the last presentation, it was very, very clear. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit on what we did. And you also heard that in the last presentation, I think. Um, um, so the anxiety that was there, and, and Thais already said, uh, precarious people in, in a precarious uh, uh, situation are, of course, always in such situations hit the hardest. Um, and that is, that is true. Our graduate school did a lot to bring people together online. And it is true. Um, it is not a substitute for, um, for physical meetings, but it still helped a little bit. It went online with all the training courses uh, for PhD students. And uh, those training courses were, let's say, also a social uh, moment uh, to bring uh, people together, but they organized social meetings uh, as well. We recognized very early on um, the hard situation that PhD students uh, were in and still are in, also now in, in, in our situation where we have to work from home. So what we did is open, uh, open office space for P PhD students that could not work at home. We did that already in the first lockdown uh, to make sure that they had uh, the possibility to work. We couldn't take away the worries that many of them had, uh, especially non-Dutch uh, PhD students, but also other staff members with families in countries that were hard hit by the pandemic and who were very, um, uh, worried by the situation of their family members. And that was all over the staff. So from PhDs to uh, full professors. Um, it was a kind of coincidence that to reduce the workload, we already had a plan to hire more staff, but it was, so that was in the time of the pandemic. And that was, that helped also a little bit. Um, we, the the uh, the um, national program for uh, for teaching the the NPO uh, money was mentioned that was given to us by the uh, by the government um, for extensions. Uh, we spent we doubled that money to give more expansion uh, extensions to early career researchers to PhDs and postdocs. Um, I think recently the new uh, collective labor agreement also. Uh, took away, or it does now take away, uh, some of the worries about permanent contracts because um, um, our um, uh, UDAs are now uh, given a, a permanent contract after one year of a temporary contracts. Um, that might also help a little bit, but it doesn't. Of, it does, of course, not help with respect to uh, promotion tra to tra trajectories. Um, We came up a lot of times with, uh, or we try to come up <laughs> with uh, tailor-made solutions for individual situations. Um, as uh, Victor uh, said, how his uh, faculty or, or institute 
paid for a co coaching trajectory. We did a lot of this um, in our faculty for, uh, for senior, but also for junior uh, staff members. We do that in normal times, but in the pandemic, we intensified um, those, uh, those possibilities. Um, so what the, what the um, report makes very clear is that on the one hand, you have uh, clear um, groups who suffered most from the pandemic and who, who still will suffer most from the pandemic. So uh, people with a temporary contract and uh, parents with uh, young children. Um, for the rest, the situations uh, among staff members have been very, very divergent. Um, and I think what we must learn, and this also ties in with uh, recognition and reward, is to be a little bit more flexible um, and to be prepared to find tailor-made solutions for individual situations. Um, when I look at the future, um, it will not be the case that we will get rid of this pandemic uh, in a very short time. So we have to find a way to live with a situation where we might be in home working situations and then be on campus again and then be at home again. Um, um, so we, we need to be, as an organization, we need to be more flexible, but also as individuals, we will need to find out how we can be more flexible. And that means that the organization, the universities also have to work with uh, everybody to, to increase also not only um, organizational re resilience, but also um, individual uh, uh, resilience. Um, people must experience more agency about their situation. Um, and probably also a little bit, and that might sound hard, but I do not mean that, but um, find out and accept how you deal with very difficult life events that always come up and come in situations where you do not ask for them, um, but you have to deal with them. And, um, and how can we talk about those things together and how can we find solutions for individuals in such uh, situations? Um, how can we, and, and I think the question about leadership is very, very urgent here. So how can supervisors, how can line managers, and how can, deans, um, 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 faculty boards, university boards um, contribute to the resilience of the institution and of all the staff members. That is the question that we will have, uh, find, have to find an answer to um, in the next months and years. Um, I think agency is also something that, that uh, staff, researchers, teachers, um, may um, experience when in the future many more conferences will be held online so that they can decide to what conferences will they really physically go and what conferences will they attend um, online. Um, it is not easy, it has not been easy when the pandemic started. Um, I personally thought when we are at home, when we will be at home for two weeks, things will normalize again. And now we realize that uh, things won't normalize for a very long time, probably. Although I hope that the situation will not remain um, as, it is, as it is now. Um, I will be very open for questions. Um, and if I may, well, the whole um, event, the meeting ends uh, in 10 minutes, I think. I really have to, to leave in 10 minutes. So if there are questions, I will be very happy to, to answer them. Um, the idea that a university is a community is the, probably the most important aspect to take with us for the times to come. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, we'll respect your leaving time. Um, it's lovely that that has come out of really all the presentations, that everyone really here has focused on the problems other people have had and um, has tried to think about how we together by helping each other out as a community, we can make things a little bit less bad. 
Um, can I actually ask you a question straight away since you have to leave and then maybe other panelists also want to weigh in. But um, something that you already uh, touched on is the fact that our the measures we've taken were initially measures to fix a, a sort of short situation and the situation is not short, the situation is ongoing. Yeah. Are there sort of structural changes that would help you? Things that are outside your control, but that someone else could do, say the government or the safe bay, that would put you in a better position to, to set up long-term structures for dealing with the problem. Yeah, well, of course it has been said by other speakers, by many speakers uh, actually, and that, that's a good thing. The PricewaterhouseCoopers report um, is very important here. So if you do not have enough money as an institution, it is very hard to come up with long-term um, solutions to a problem from which you do not know about which you do not know how long it will stay. Um, so you do not have the extra money uh, uh, to, to, to just, just it for, for, for the situation, just in case, you know, that, that you can spend. So it would really help if the government would, uh, would give us the, the money that PricewaterhouseCoopers, and that is the minimum, I would say, um, invest in research, invest in academic teaching, because it is so important not only for us academics, <laughs> as, it, as it is, of course, also, but for our society. And I think the German, the new German government at least understands that a little bit, as the German government has understood that uh, uh, better than our governments for a long time. So that is really a plea that would help. But of course, we also have to take our own responsibilities and try um, to think, um, uh, to, to stop th to think ad hoc, but to think about long-term measures. And, and we only started by, uh, with the uh, recognition and, 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 and reward um, uh, trajectory. And I think we, we will certainly use it to, to, um, to become more flexible um, with uh, dealing with, so it doesn't, I'm, I'm, I very much agree with the, with the previous speaker, lower the standards doesn't help, but be more flexible in how you reach the standards and give uh, researchers and academics, other ac academics, more agency in how they want to profile themselves and how they can profile themselves, given, um, let's say, the situation they find themselves in. That would, I think, be a good thing. Thank you so much, uh, Tony. Um, and hopefully recognition and rewards will also help us to reward those who sort of are making the situation bearable by being collegial and in a, in a better way, in a kind of concrete uh, way. Thank you so much. Um, I think Natalie just uh, raised a hand. Yeah, again, thank you and then and all the speakers for, for these, these, these very personal and relevant observations. Um, and Tony, you started out by saying that we um, have to start thinking about more long-term structural changes, and I wholeheartedly agree. Um, it is also a huge task, and um, which which can be kind of discouraging for many. So my question for you would be: where to start, and and who should start doing so? Um, where should we get started having this conversation, and and, and which kind of platforms? Is that something that each university should? look out from themselves is where to get started i think in a way we already started when we started the recognition and reward discussion um, and that this is being done and on a national level it's also done being done internationally and locally um, um, so it will not help if we now uh, urgently start all kinds of new discussions so what we should do is find the structures and the discussions that are already going on and try to moderate or to modify them in a way that helps us to become more resilient for the years to come. And that was a, a process that was already going on, only without the pandemic. We started without a pandemic. Now we know that uh, pandemics might hit in the future also. If we get rid of this COVID pandemic, there might be other pandemics coming, there might be other very, um, let's say, structural um, uh, problems um, um, that we ha will have to deal with, climate change, um, uh, refugees uh, coming. So it, it, it's not just this, it's, it's a, a, a world that is changing rapidly um, in, 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 in well, very impactful uh, ways. So we have to think about a university, universities and ac academy, um, um, that might have a very different um, 
um, uh, look, and it might be necessarily much more uh, flexible than we are now. And I, I don't have the solution at this, at this moment, but discussions like those uh, will help us to get there um, um, slowly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ludwin Porthuis would like to ask a question. Yes. Hi, thank you for your great contribution. I was wondering, because I really applaud the fact that you uh, are looking into making conditions and, and criteria for promotion more flexible, but um, it's also one of our, our uh, recommendations, yet there is the pitfall of uh, not being able to combine um, flexibility with clarity, because we know that um, especially uh, a pitfall is, is bias in how to assess uh, criteria and when they become more flexible there's also more room for bias so um, what can we do to prevent uh, the entering of even more bias in uh, selection uh, procedures at this point when we're going to make everything more flexible it will always be uh, flexibility within uh, boundaries i think um, because otherwise we will not be transparent anymore um, so that's the first part of the answer. And the other part of the answer is, as academics, we invented peer review. Um, and that is something that we can use very easily um, for uh, promotion tra trajectories. Um, and we do that already, but we can make that stronger. Um, um, that is one way of making... So, so, let's say, of making the trajectory more transparent, also in the way you weigh uh, criteria and you assess what has been done under the um, marker of one criteria. So that would be my, my, my uh, first answer to this question, I think, um, without being able to say, I know how it has to be done. We will have to discuss this together and then find a way where we can where early career researchers and, and more senior researchers say, well, this is what we accept for our field as a flexible but still transparent uh, way of, of, uh, well, of doing this. Thank you. I think uh, we're nearly uh, out of time. So um, I just want to say one tiny thing before, I, before we wrap this up. And that's that we haven't talked a lot today about a group that's also been very hit very hard by the pandemic. And that is um, people in temporary contracts who ha only have a contract for teaching. That's because we haven't really talked about teaching because this was about the effect of COVID on research. And there was at some point an idea to also briefly talk about teaching. Then we thought, no, that's an entirely different and huge problem, which we short should talk about, but not in 10 minutes at the end of a meeting about research. So um, that is something that I just want to flag as something that we have not talked about today, but that should be talked about the effect on teachers and on teaching of this pandemic. Um, but to wrap up what we have been able to say today, um, I think it's become very clear that the effects of the pandemic have been and still are very different for different groups, that we need to keep monitoring them, that we need to react flexibly, but as Lidwin just cautioned us, maybe not um, maybe make sure that flexibility doesn't mean unclarity or introduces extra bias. More importantly, though, clearly the pandemic has ag acted, as Patais beautifully said, as a magnifying glass for um, problems that were already there. And we need structural change, real structural change, to make the university a more resilient or any, any place where research is done, a more resilient place in the face of potential ongoing and future crises, which certainly involves something looking at recognition and rewards and looking at the university as, as a community where we do things together rather than out compete each other. Um, that's, I think, some of the takeaways um, from this session. Thank you very much, everyone who's contributed as a panelist or as a speaker. Um, we've recorded this and this will go online on the YouTube channel of the Canavi. Um, uh, we will also, um, the team writing the report, go very carefully through the Q&A again, look at all of your questions. So I just, you, it will, everything will be noted and worked into the report. So thank you very, very much again, everyone who's contributed and uh, good afternoon to everyone.